After weeks of unveiling his 80-page manifesto, the APC presidential candidate, Bola Tinubu, has uh, since been canvassing for votes by detailing his vision plan for Nigeria. The latest is in London at the Chatham House, where he listed security, employment, economic reform, amongst others, as some of the things he would improve on if elected president. Although many have criticized Bola Tinubu of not being able to tackle Nigeria's problems, the pro presidential candidate is still very sure he is the only one who can bring the country out of its tentacles. Joining us in the studio is a member of the, AP, of the APC, Oluwa Shion Fale. Also in the studio is a political analyst, Biodun Shoumi. Gentlemen, good morning. It's good to have you on the program good this morning. Good morning. Right. Let's begin with um, your uh, assessment of uh, the APC presidential candidates uh, uh, speaking and perhaps uh, how he's showing at the, the Chatham House because uh, that has come under huge criticism uh, after that uh, event. And many has uh, criticized his choice of going to Chatham House to speak about his plans and all of that, that um, he shunned, you know, town halls and all of the meetings that um, other presidential candidates were invited for in Nigeria, but decided to go uh, on an international platform to speak instead of speaking directly to Nigerians. What do you make of that? Let me begin with you. Uh, well, in the first instance, um, uh, we need to acknowledge one thing. Candidates are just like any other candidates. It is up to them to decide how they want to campaign, conduct their campaign, whether it's virtually, whether it's physical appearance, town hall meetings, or campaign rallies, or street shows. It's up to candidates to determine that. But that said, in the case of Tinubu, it is also not correct to say that he has not been talking to Nigerians directly. He has had several town hall meetings, uh, which I am aware of. It's all in the newspapers, you know, and televisions. Is that several town hall meetings talking to Nigerians? People are able to engage um, his views. The concern of those who are actually, you know, articulating uh, is running away from um, uh, debates and all that. It's strictly because they organize a platform, and these are media believed to have been compromised, you know, and then organizing a platform, you know, asking um, Tinumbu to come. Mm -hmm. You know, you do not go to your, the, the house of your adversary, you know, for dinner. Well, well, you, you need to, ex, uh, you know, expatiate on compromise. They say some of the, yes. these media have been compromised, and I'm sure a lot of Nigerians want to understand what you mean by... Yeah, I, I would um, gladly say that. Right. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, when you look at Arise TV particularly, less about Channels TV, but more about Arise TV, they editorialize. You'll see the anchor person actually editorializing, you know, on screen. you see highly unprofessional conduct, you know, of the anchor becoming the guest, you know, in so many, virtually on a daily basis. You can't have that happening within the profession of journalism, and nobody can dispute that. Particularly, I don't want to start mentioning individual names, names you know, in, in that station. That is not how these things are done. Number two, we should also remember the fact that prior to this election, Broadcasting Organization of Nigeria, BON, has been the one responsible for organizing, you know, um, unbiased, impartial debate. So what has changed suddenly um, in 2022-23 elections and then you have a situation where Arise TV is insisting that you have to attend. Let, let, let me give you a good example. It's like asking Atiku to come to TVC or, or Peter Obi, and I doubt whether they've been here. They, they would... Members of the Labour Party have been here. Members, members of the PDP have been here. Yes, members of APC have gone to Arise TV. Right. No, but when you have those presidential aspirants to come you know, to a TV station they think is sympathetic to their opponent, They'll find it difficult. It's like asking your adversary, you know, to come for dinner but, in, but is, in his own is, house. Is this supposed to be an issue in the first place, where it, any political party, uh, any candidate of any political party goes to any TV station to speak? It shouldn't have. It shouldn't be a problem. It shouldn't be a problem, except when people make it a campaign issue. When you have a TV station editorializing 
and insisting, except you attend my program, even without consultation with you on fixing the dates, not even knowing your own program, right. that cannot be acceptable. And for me, that is what I mean by compromised. And uh, that should not um, happen to start with. All Broadcasting right. Organization of Nigeria, born has always been organizing you know, political debate. So what is wrong in, with this election that Bonn is not being allowed or Bonn is not, you know, actually doing that? Because the, the, the Bonn uh, debate is actually a multimedia agency uh, debate. Right. That is, no, the fact of ownership can influence, you know, um, how anchors or how right. things are conducted in one station or the other. But once you have a multimedia agency's approach to it, it builds confidence and trust you know, in that very process. And I think that is what we need to go back uh, to now, particularly right. with the experience, you know. Uh, let me get Oluwashio's uh, position on this matter. Do you share the same sentiment with him that uh, perhaps uh, because of compromise in everything he has said, wh where do you stand with regards to what is the criticism? I, I align with him fully. And I think that is the concern of, you know, uh, of our party generally. That's unbiased platform with which to disseminate our agenda and our, and our issues. Uh, the truth is that um, fundamentally the constitution of Nigeria does not um, stipulate that a presidential candidate or any law for that matter must mm -hmm. undertake any debate. But the norm has always been, like he said, for the NBC to organize one that is multi-agency and multi-party you know, led that breeds the kind of confidence that we're talking about. And I'm, I'm, I hope that that will happen. And I'm sure if that happens, uh, you know, um, the candidates would consider it. I indeed, um, the interaction between a campaign team and um, media houses that seek to provide a debate platform is nothing new. You always want to see that the platform is you know, is transparent yeah. and that the questions are balanced. And that's why you see even in established climes where the management team or the strategy team of any presidential candidates will engage the house or the organizers as to the rules and regulations uh, underpinning that those debates. So it's not a strange um, idea for us to seek to have a balanced platform which which when you say to, balance uh, because uh, that some will say is relative what what do you describe as being balanced basically devoid of divide uh, of bias opinions and subjectivity that's all that's all we're saying it's, there's now, nothing th to that. there's this other question of is uh, a debate a true test of capacity and character when uh, a, a perhaps uh, a candidate comes out to say yes i am giving myself for, for opening up to a debate, but does that really prove that this person is capable of delivering on his promises and has the capacity to carry on on the reins of whatever position is going for? Well, um, basically, to be honest, debate um, always gives an insight into your plans. Right. It does not tell you the details. It does not tell you practically how things would happen. You only have a broad view of what the person is trying to do, but not the specifics in real terms. Um, for me, with um, Chatham, uh, Chatham House debate, we've actually seen some specifics, you know, uh, being, um, uh, be, be, uh, be, uh, being talked about. I'll, I'll give you a good example. Right. Um, I actually watched the whole program, and I went back to rewatch it quite a number of times. Uh, you know, you have the impression of a candidate who understands what the problems in the country, you know, uh -huh, you know, and I am very, very impressed with the way that is linking the domestic policies to our foreign policies mm. to the extent that um, I got a call from a, 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 the, the, the ambassador coordinating uh, the diplomatic platform, Ambassador Ganela, while yesterday on this very particular issue, um, saying that um, it's not common for candidates to do that in Nigeria, but Tinumbu has actually linked, you know, the domestic policies, you know, to our foreign policies. Mm. So uh, for me, that's, that's a plus. Then you also see, you know, the link between economic security and our national security. That was clearly put out um, in the open. The need to decentralize a centralized electric, um, electricity 
the generation and distribution system mm. to unbundle it was actually also hurt in the public. You know, the monetary policies and so many other things were actually hurt in specifics. I think we got more heart of that than um, just people giving us a broad views um, and all that. Um, I know that some people complain. I read some of the comments about um, about his style, the style of um, delivery Team management. Yes, and, teamship. Yeah, the teamship, which mm. people complain about. Me, I am a fan of shared governance. Um, probably maybe because of my home background in United Kingdom. And I think um, Tinumbu Media Handlers actually chose the right place to do that, which is in UK. In UK, even when it comes to employment, ask anybody. The focus are always your ability to delegate, mm. teamwork. Teamwork. Those are the issues they look for in your leadership skills. Mm. If you don't have that, forget it, you won't get a job. And the same thing applies to government. So we have a candidate who came to Shatterhouse, you know, out of about 10 questions, he answered four, and he delegated six, you know, to those who will work with him. And for me, that's about shared governance. It's a good ethos that actually brings out the best capable um, brains, you know, in a team to deliver on the plans of the principal. Not only that, it also shows that not one person knows it all. You know, and you are willing to bring in the necessary um, uh, uh, people required to deliver on your objectives. So I am not one of those who feel uh, concerned that why wow, other people answer the question. The man answered four out of about ten questions, and I think I'm comfortable with that. And he did that very effectively. So it's something which we are not used to in Nigeria, right. but we are beginning to see, you know, the issue of um, shared land, uh, shared governance, and shared learning coming, you know, up uh, for debates. But, you know. but Chatham House, in reacting to this matter of uh, teamship, uh, said that uh, uh, the the chairman, their chairman, was ambushed, and that uh, uh, the Tinubu's delegating his team to respond to the question was. Uh, undermined, or, or he was asked to under, undermine its uh, normal arrangement, so that it undermined their normal arrangement in Chatham House. And I wonder what your reaction is to, to what they are saying. I, I want to believe that the essence of inviting Tinubu to Chatham House was to listen to him. Right. And in giving and delivering his speech for about 30 minutes, he was listened to. Every other further engagement out of that is secondary to the primary idea of his giving his ideas and his, um, his plans for Nigeria. Um, importantly to note is, is that our foreign policy articulation is a continuation of our domestic plans. Yeah. And all of those foreign policies engagement are to actualize and promote our domestic agenda. And we also have to understand that Nigeria is a very, very important country in the continent and, of course, much more important in the sub-region. And all Ashwaju has done with that speech is to situate that importance in the global community to portray that, look, his government will be much more responsible to the responsibility of Nigeria within the sub-region and the African continent as a whole. And that message was aptly delivered in that speech, and I see no reason for concern. The most important thing is listening to him, and he was he, he gave his speech as as he as he planned to. We, we should also, if you are allow me to add, yeah. that apart from Nigeria itself, the choice of London, it's quite very important. Right. The location of the highest concentration of Nigerians outside Nigeria in any part of the world is actually in the southeast of um, London, Peckham, Camberwell area, just about four kilometers down the road from. Royal Institute of Inter International mm. Affairs, which we call Chatham House. Mm. So that's quite very significant and very important, you know, to not only engage Nigerians at home, but also engage Nigerians in diaspora. We've been talking about diaspora voting. Yes, yes it has not happened. Mm. But they contribute significantly, you know, to our um, uh, foreign, foreign currency inflow into mm. our country. So therefore, they, it's quite very important that they are engaged and I'm pleased that not only Tinubu, Atiku has gone to Shatamas, and at least all of them are going there to actually talk to Nigerians because there has to be a bridge between home and a huge community outside 
Nigeria. Uh, and that is what he has achieved with his uh, showing absolutely. at uh, Chatham House. Uh, absolutely. Right. And uh, quite very robust. Uh, many, even some of them did ask um, personal questions. You know, absolutely. Issues, which I am very impressed with. And Tinumbu decided to open up. You know, and said, look, let us talk about it. No holds bad on the issues of specifics relating to security. We know it's not a general, mm -hmm. but it details somebody who knows about, who can deal with the issue, Absolutely. who has a, an experience of dealing, you know, with um, security situation to answer that, that question. Mm -hmm. On different... On issues area, of the economy as on well. On the economy. He did the same thing. He called on um, economy and job creation, called on Wali Edun, who happened to be a former commissioner for finance in Lagos State, who he had worked with, mm -hmm. who he knew quite all right that would be competent, you know, to deal with the issue. So, you know, at times, leadership is not about you doing things yourself. You should be able to identify clearly, you know, the skills needed to do the job. It's like a manager. A manager cannot be the security man, you cannot be the, uh, the factory worker, while at the same time, the human resource manager, while at the same time trying to manage the whole complex. Mm -hmm. So you must be able to identify the appropriate skills, human resources needed uh, to achieve certain goals. And that's exactly what we've seen, you know, which Tinumbu in Tinumbu speaks, called teamship. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, it's about teamwork and ability to deliver and also to govern the relationship you know, uh, uh, within your team. And that, we have seen that effectively, you know, uh, showcased at Chatham House. Yes, correctly, Chatham House has not, they, they, they've never had that experience yes. of um, uh, people bringing in their own... Delegates to de speak. Yes, but it's also another innovation. Mm -hmm. Don't be surprised, you begin to see this happening, you know, Moving from forward. time to time. Mm. For instance, in NDI, in uh, United States, uh, National Endowment for Democracy, NED, that has not happened. But you will begin to see this happening because it's even more instructive. It's not just about a candidate's ability to cram figures and cram things like we do in schools and then regurgitate it. No, this is about a candidate saying, listen, I do not know it all. I have a team that will achieve the objective. And teamwork is excellent. Teamwork, you know, achieves objective rather than one person. We want to move away from an era where we think a Messiah, somebody, the leader is the Messiah. No, there's no Messiah anywhere. We all have to work together to save our country. Right. And that message actually went out, you know, brilliantly. Right. Do you think that we understand, you know, our relationship with the United Kingdom and it, the position in our country thus far? Do you think that uh, the person of uh, Ashwa Tinubu has been able to sell himself convincingly to perhaps garner their support? Uh, for the election, uh, because you also recall that he mentioned something about um, uh, the West not trusting Buhari, President Buhari, enough. Do you think that he's been able to show that uh, he can be trusted? I think over time, with his engagement with the Western world generally, uh, Ashwaji has shown to be a man that can be trusted. I know for a fact that he's been personal friends for so many um, ambassadors, United States, United Kingdom ambassadors to Nigeria. And that's really because of the personal relationship and the ethos that he knows it brings to bear on general democratic issues that are important to the Western world. So I have no concern that that trust will be built. And this is one of the building blocks. And importantly, is also is that that forum was also to speak to Nigerians in diaspora. Mm -hmm. uh, you will see that even in the engagement that day, one of the key issues was about diaspora engagement in voting and civic responsibility in Nigeria. That question did come up, and it speaks to one of the cardinal points in the action plan under the foreign policy agenda to encourage and work with the National Assembly to deepen and the process by which the diasporans can get involved in voting and you know voting process in Nigeria. And Ashwaja has reiterated for that, that given their financial and economic contribution to Nigerian economy, it's also very important that they also have a say as to who become the leaders of Nigeria. And in that way, we would encourage and work with the National Assembly to bring that to bear. But of course, with the understanding and the need for INEC to also live up to his responsibility to demonstrate as we require them to do during this process, 
the forthcoming election to demonstrate the sanctity of the election, to yes. demonstrate the process, that the process is first and foremost um, easy for those that are in Nigeria before we then introduce, you know, the mailing ballots that, um, you know, a diaspora voting will require. So this sort of forum is very, very useful for building this sort of rapport that is necessary to mm. generate trust. Mm. Um, the key issues for any Western government, particularly the UK, US, it's this, to see that the, those that will be entrusted with the leadership of Nigeria are mindful of their international, regional, and sub-regional obligations and leadership um, requirements. And I should have demonstrated that by saying specifically that within sub Africa, uh, sub, the West African sub-region, we will continue to collaborate both diplomatically and militarily to reduce strife, to reduce cross-border terrorism. And those are the key issues bothering uh, the global uh, norm as we speak. Absolutely. I, I want to sh uh, ask you the same question, if he has been able to show that he can be trusted, uh, especially by a trust coming from uh, the Western world as he spoke, uh, just like the question I asked him uh, just now, talking about trusting that he'll be able to take the country to where it's necessary. The Western world can trust him because that statement he made with regards to the West not trusting Buhari enough with regards to arms purchase and all of it uh, is also another issue of concern for a lot of Nigerians. Yes, um, the issue of um, the West not trusting Buhari, which he actually mentioned, um, he didn't go into details. Yeah. Um, it's actually about a human rights record, the Nigerian army human rights mm -hmm. record as perceived by the West. You know, and how that influenced arms purchases. No doubt about that. I mean, um, even we face that problem uh, um, under Jonathan, President Jonathan, yes, when yes. they refused to sell their arms. Wari is not the only one facing it because they have their own concerns. Mm -hmm. um, they use their human rights, you know, to drive their um, um, foreign policy, and that is what um, the West does. So because of that, the West did not particularly have any problem with Buhari as a person, but they have some concerns in relation to a human rights record, um, particularly in relation to the military in Nigeria, which in any case, many of the cases complain about. The Nigerian military, you know, um, keep investigating them. So therefore, Tinumbu is actually, that is why it was not categorical yes. on, on that very area, but he's saying maybe, maybe yes. not. But what he's saying is that we have to respond to the concerns of those who are selling arms to us, you know, uh, with a view to be able to assess the necessary equipment needed to, you know, fight crime and fight uh, terrorism in our country. But he also gave out something which is quite very innovative, which will resonate, you know, with the Western world, which is when he made a reference to blood oil. You will recall the issue of... Um, Blood diamond, yes, uh, in Syria alone, and how that became a major problem, and then you know the global world had to get fixated on if you steal the diamond and you don't have a place to sell it, mm. you know, it will now become so difficult to do that, and that's exactly what they did, and eventually uh, they're able to solve the issue of um, um, blood diamond. So Tinumbu brought in the issue of um, blood oil, you know, that is. Yes, he acknowledged the fact that we, part of the problem we're facing economically is the theft of oil, mm. of our oil. Nobody can deny that. But he came out with a solution that, look, I will chase you know, the blood oil. That is, it's not just about preventing it from being stolen to start with in Nigeria, but they will trace the sources, you know, where these are sold, and then ensure that there is an international resolve you know, to block that. So once we're able to block it, and they can't get them sold, there'll be no need to steal them to start with. And that will res resonate very, very well with the West because nobody has done that. Nobody's talking about that. And no country in the whole world, you know, has actually, you know, been able to learn from the blood diamond um, uh, experience, experience mm. and then apply it to their own domestic situation. For me, that is innovative. Mm. And you can't take it away from him. It will play very well, you know, with the Western world. Now, he also spoke about addressing the issue of uh, small arms and light weapons, which is a major challenge uh, in the country as we speak. It's been a challenge mopping up uh, these weapons uh, across the country. 
Uh, we've seen, you mentioned the issue of our borders, addressing the border challenge, border security and all of it. Could you just quickly speak to that, this matter? I mean, we, we know that the cross-border, you know, um, transportation of small arms has and been, weapons. and large weapons have been the cause, one of the major cause of the insurgency and some insecurity that we have. And that's why it is also important for a much more extensive collaboration within the sub-region and the continent to eradicate the sort of strifes that, you know, encourage that. But most importantly, in dealing with that, you need to go to our security initiatives under the action plan, mm. which is basically to basically secure the borders in a way that prevents the proliferation of these arms into the country. And by that doing is by ensuring that the Nigerian custom, the immigration services, and of course the Nigerian security architecture as a whole are up to the task in ensuring that some of these arms do not find their way into the country. And in that doing, we will prevent some of the sort of security challenges that we see around, particularly from unrest in Libya, Mali coming into the country. And that's key. And it is by international collaboration that really that can be done. And that's really one of the really key um, subjects that he touched on in, at, at his. Yes, and he mentioned that uh, Buhari has done his best. President Buhari has done his best with addressing issues of uh, insecurity. A lot of Nigerians do not agree with that, looking at what we are going through with regards to kidnapping, uh, the, the, the number of uh, bandit activity, and all of it. Oh, no doubt. I actually um, am one of those who used to be very, very concerned about um, the, the state of security in the country. Um, but when you take a sober look, I do a sober assessment. Is the situation the same as what Buhari inherited? When Buhari came to power, you know, about 15 or 17 local governments were actually under occupation with Iswar, Islamic States in West Africa's flag, actually planted on our soil. That was the situation. And the man has done his best. He's been able to degrade the capacity of Boko Haram to occupy any part of our country. They went back to the forest. Yes, we have not totally eliminated Boko Haram, mm -hmm. but we've also seen the nature of, um, of, of terrorism, of insurgency. It has mutated. It's partly what has mutated into banditry, into increase in kidnapping and all that. That's the nature of, um, um, of, of insurgency, and that's the nature of terrorism. So, but again, we have to deal with that. And that is what Tinubu is saying, look, we will deal with this situation because we are, but we must acknowledge the progress made by Buhari and he can't run away from that. While at the same time, uh, those who disagree with Buhari or those who won't see anything good about Buhari or Tinubu will continue to say that, look, um, the man wants to continue the mystery. He wants uh, kidnapping to continue, but that's not true. Mm -hmm. We know the fact. The fact of the matter is Boko Haram, is no longer occupying any part of our country today. Yes, they are still in the forest. Yes, our gallant military officers are working day and night to ensure that they make it so the forest so uncomfortable for them. While at the same time, we need to increase, you know, the number of our personnel, as explained, you know, mm, at yes. the Shatam House, to deal, you know, with the security situation. Nothing new will be done other than look for a way to resolve the issue of um, Western concerns about a human rights record with a view to have access to arms, while at the same time increase the manpower and training of the Nigerian military. Now, you, you, he spoke about some personal issues, uh, and uh, if you look at the papers this morning, you see uh, that report uh, on the papers uh, talking about how he made his monies and how it is that uh, he is one of the most criticized candidates. Uh, do you think that he addressing all of these issues, perhaps we put these issues to rest finally? No, I don't think so, because they are politically motivated in the first place. Mm. They, they are non-issue in the first place, but the opposition keep bringing them up. Um, like he said, and like you alluded to, I don't think that there's any politician in Nigeria that has been widely and extensively investigated as much as Ashwaju. And that's why 
Um, even despite those investigations, there has never been any prosecution brought against him for any financial fraud or any you know, public service fraud or anything. So it's really surprising when people then insinuate that he's corrupt or he's this or he's that. So really, we believe that he won't stop because typically when you're a front runner in elections of this nature, people throw all sorts of data at you. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it's not something that we envisage that it will stop. But him speaking about it and putting those records straight is well and good so that at least you can then, you know, uh, take things from his perspective if you wish to. Um, the truth is that um, his wealth has never been in doubt for us that know him. Um, it comes from a, an extensively uh, rich family. And uh, he's, like he said, he inherited wide-ranging real estate yes. that he has used his education and his relationship to then nurture and, you know, and has brought about tremendous yield. So it, it, we don't really understand why the, you know, why the challenges and that all of this talk about his wealth. But importantly also is to speak about his age and educational background mm. and all of that. Every document that he has presented over time has always been consistent. And truly, um, we're surprised that at the time that Mr. Tinubu is running for the president is when they're now debating whether he went to primary school or he didn't go to primary school or he went to university. So, like I said, these insinu insinuations will not stop. Mm -hmm. But we're happy to put the record straight and let Nigerians decide for themselves who is better able and capable to lead the country. The truth is that if you look at the record of other candidates, they are nowhere near what his academic achievements and records are or what his performances are in office. All right. Any final words before we wrap, we wrap up now? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, in a nature, in a country like this, <clears throat> people hang on a lot of things in the air without actually, you know, executing the, the person, you know, when you throw up a lot of um, cloudy things and just to confuse voters, so if you can't convince them, then confuse them. Right. Uh, then people will begin to ask the question, no, can we really trust the person? But that's what I think is going on. But I think the um, opponents of um, uh, Chief uh, Ashwaju Chinumbu are not even helping their own cause, in the sense that why not focus on selling your plans? For Nigeria. This is a man who is selling his vision and is now moving beyond that, appearing presidential, coming up with a theme. And you are still busy with um, did he go to primary school or which secondary school? I mean, it's quite ri ridiculous. I think we need to move away from that. They need to change their strategy and then engage Tinubu on his vision, engage him on his plan to transform our country. Mm -hmm. This is the only way our country will get enriched, you know, by this um, presidential um, election process experience. All right, and this is where we leave the conversation. We must thank you, uh, a member of uh, the APC, Uluwashi Mfaleye, as well as political analyst, uh, Biodrin Shoumi, for your time. Thank you. My program. pleasure.